perhaps for those um, who haven't met all of us, do we want to do a quick intro before we get started? Sure. Absolutely. So Ryan, your screen is on from my side. Do you want to go first? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Ryan. I'm one of the podiatrists at Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. Um, we're a team of five podiatrists and we work across two locations, um, a clinic in Essendon um, and a clinic in Blackburn um, as well. Um, we work alongside uh, the physios at Melbourne Sports Physiotherapy, um, so Lyndon um, as well. And I'll touch more on that later, but yeah, I'll let Lyndon introduce himself as well. Yeah, hey everyone, I'm Lyndon. I'm a physiotherapist at Melbourne Sports Physio. Um, we work uh, quite hand in hand with our Melbourne's, uh, Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. So we often um, can cross treat uh, patients that we find quite difficult. And um, yeah, we're just seeing some, some very, very similar trends in um, the injuries coming through the clinic. And Lisa's seen some of these trends as well um, with some of her clients. And we thought we'd uh, put on a webinar tonight. Yeah. Joining. So for those who don't know me, my name is Lisa, obviously, as well. And I'm a clinical nutritionist at LSS Nutrition. So I work uh, predominantly online since COVID, <laughs> or only online, actually, I should say. So, um, yeah, certainly since COVID hit, there's obviously been a bit of comfort eating and more alcohol consumption on a few people's behalf. So I figured... Uh, Letting go of some of that COVID creep might be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for those who've just jumped in, just a quick housekeeping as well for those who've missed uh, my previous message. But down the bottom of the panel of Zoom, there should be um, a chat box for you all. So if you click on chat, you can ask us any questions at any point during the um, presentation. So you've got the option down that if you've selected chat, you'll notice down the very bottom where it says to type your message, you can select who you're messaging that to. So it can be to all panelists, which is just us three. It can be to all panelists and attendees, which means that anyone else watching this will also get the benefit of seeing what questions everyone else is asking. So that's kind of handy for a lot of people. Um, or you can message one of us uh, directly. We will aim to answer those, um, hopefully a couple as we go along, but there'll be time at the end to answer those. So if you're thinking about something whilst we're presenting, chuck in your questions straight away so you don't forget, and we'll make sure we get to it at the end at the very least. There'll also be, once we actually start the presentation in a moment, um, you'll notice our heads will end up um, on the right of your screen. And uh, maybe I'll talk about that, how you can move us around if we're in the way of the presentation um, once it's there, so it's a bit more visually obvious of <laughs> how to do it. We just got a couple more people rolling in. So we might start at about 6.05. Yeah, cool. Um, when everyone's set. But please, if you guys have any questions, use that chat box. We're, we're going to have a Q&A at the end and we're happy to answer all of those questions that you guys have. Yeah, definitely. We're a bit spread out um, across Melbourne at the moment between the three of us. Let us know where you're watching from. The boys are over in Blackburn. I'm actually in Sunbury, which is northwest of Melbourne. Um, be interesting to see how far this, <laughs> how far you're all watching this from. Ah, awesome. Leah's watching from Coburg. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Leah. Oh, wow. Ashburton, Box Hill. Croydon, Essendon. Good, great mix. Yeah, Pasco Vale, Strathmore, Blackburn South. <laughs> Local, yeah. Hoburg. <laughs> yeah. So predominantly areas close to the, the main. Right in Kensington. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, I wish I could say Bali. <laughs> 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 um, 
Quick scray reservoir. Awesome. I think we're um, pretty much ready to get the uh, ball rolling. So I might um, I might organise um, the presentation to start. Just give me one second, everyone. And and here we are. Beautiful. Lisa, did you want to mention um, about how people can help that uh, that chat box on the not the chat box, sorry, the um, the camera box on the side? Yeah, so chat box should still be there like it was before, but our heads now um, will be over to the right of your screen. So you'll notice above all of our heads, there's a little black panel which has got on the left hand side of that. Um, a function to, to hide us entirely, which you can do if you get sick of looking at us. Um, you can, the, the box in the middle is to show just the active speaker. So it just means that you'll only see the one person who's talking at that time and it would take up less space of your um, screens. Or you can keep us on that right hand button where there's two mm. rectangles on top of each other that will have the three of us all there. So pick whichever one works for you. And if we do get in the way of the presentation behind us, you can um, toggle your mouse over that black um, bar that's above the three of our heads and, and just move us around the screen wherever it's less um, annoying for you. <laughs> Hopefully that made sense. All right, let's get the um, presentation starting. So Lisa's going to take us off first and um, I'll just, sorry, I'll just get that started for you. Lisa, on this side, does the, does the, do the slides look all right to you? You can't see the bottom of the bar on that screen. No, all good, yeah. Fantastic. I'll just put um, myself on mute and Lisa. Whoops. <laughs> Alrighty. So I thought I would run you through, it, it's been requested, um, some sustainable weight loss tips that can really kickstart this journey out of lockdown for you uh, into a bit more of a healthy uh, way of being for summer. So start with step number one is start with a why. Oftentimes when we pick a goal or a new challenge, we don't actually know why we're doing it. Sure, we might want to lose weight, but that doesn't really answer that underlying why. So you have to think about what that might be for you. And for some people, as an example, it might be things like uh, to feel better and just more vibrant, to have more energy to play with their kids or grandkids, to um, look a certain way, and that's totally fine as well. Um, there's multiple reasons why that I haven't listed as well. Have a think about for you what that might be and write it down. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it every day, like on your fridge, on the back of the toilet door or, you know, somewhere that you're going to see on a regular basis that will remind you in times where you might feel less motivated of why you're actually doing this in the first place. And from there, break down um, some both process and outcome fo focused goals. So a lot of us tend to only focus on outcome, like losing 10 kilos or um, running a certain time uh, for, from a fitness goal. But if we don't focus also on the process goals, it can be really hard to keep motivation along the way. So a, a process goal might be to drink a certain amount of water every day to exercise a certain amount of times a week or I'll go into a few more of those examples later but more just to give you an idea of what a process goal might look like and that allows us then to just set ourselves up for positive habits no matter what the outcome ends up being necessarily. So step number two is to drink enough water. Now when I talk about water I mean pure simple 
water, not soft drink or juice or tea or coffee, even sparkling water. Do be careful of how much you consume of that just from a dental health perspective. Ideally, we want around two to three litres a day. That's a real rough ballpark, but that should be our minimum. Now, if you're highly active or if you work outside, um, depending on your job, you know, my, my job as a sedentary uh, desk worker is my requirements will be very different to a tradie who's on the tools. So have a think about that when you're estimating and set yourself reminders if you need to, to make sure that you reach your water intake. It's important for both energy production, weight loss, hormonal health, a bunch of different reasons. So drink enough water. Step number three is to limit junk food. I think we all know deep down what that looks like, um, but we do need to get realistic. I think a lot of us have been comfort eating through COVID. And in fact, I have it on good authority that chocolate and lolly sales are through the roof. So in fact, companies are seeing record sales at the moment, which is a little bit alarming for a nutritionist, but um, nonetheless, what's done is done. So if that's been you, don't fret. There's time to improve your health. So get realistic about what your weak spots are and either cut them out entirely or pick a day a week where you indulge a little bit and enjoy it and then you get back on track. Um, things like lollies, chocolate chips, anything heavily processed would be in that category. At the end of the day, it's wasted nourishment that you, you could be having a meal instead that is really nourishing and supporting of your health. So think about how you feel after eating those foods and whether or not it's um, helping you move forward. So step number four is limit alcohol. This too has been a big one for a lot of people, particularly during this time of heightened stress. At the end of the day, alcohol is actually really high in calories just on itself. And then, you know, some of us will mix it with things too. So if you're someone who opts for a spirit and then mixes it with soft drink, you've got the double whammy there. So, you know, we do need to be mindful of not just the, the calorie consumption itself, but then the load that it has on our, our health in general. Nobody feels incredibly energetic the day after a few drinks and it taxes our liver. It's, it's simply not going to make weight loss easy. The other thing that we often do when we drink is we have poorer food choices. So you get that extra effect as well. So just be mindful. If you're not a, a big drinker, maybe have a month off. If you are currently a big drinker, perhaps setting yourself weekends only for booze is a smarter strategy to make it more manageable and realistic for you, but it'll still have profound health benefits. So have a think about your intake and where you can improve there. Step number five, I know I'm being a little bit negative at the moment. <laughs> we'll get to some of the good stuff in a minute, but we do need to also be realistic on our caffeine consumption. So this is one a lot of people don't actually think about very often when it comes to um, weight loss efforts, but caffeine ultimately causes a spike in our cortisol levels. And at the moment, so maybe I should take a step back and cortisol is something that when we wake in the morning is meant to spike really high and it gives us lots of energy to get up and get moving. Over the day, it slowly drops down towards the end of the day where you don't need it and you want to peacefully fall asleep in an ideal world though, right? So what happens when we consume caffeine is you'll get a, a spike in cortisol sometimes later in the day when we don't want it. And what happens if we combine that with a global pandemic and whatever other stress you might have right now, you know, work stress or whatever it is, um, 
a lot of us are in this heightened straight state of stress where we've got constantly high cortisol, which over time, if it's constantly elevated, our bodies can't just keep pumping it out. So then we start producing too much adrenaline, sleep becomes an issue, and we're just constantly in this fight or flight response, which historically would have been great because if we were ever in that scenario, we had to run for our lives or fight for it. Now, we're usually stressed in situations where our life is not under threat and it's less of a productive mechanism. So if you are particularly highly strung, anxious, or you recognize that right now you're under increased amounts of stress or pressure, definitely cut back on your caffeine. So coffee, tea, green tea seems to be one that's less of a problem, but certainly um, coffee and tea and chai just be mindful of your consumption there and do ease back slowly if you're currently consuming a bit. If you go cold turkey, you'll end up with really bad headaches, potentially constipation and a whole lot of other issues. So definitely go easy on your reduction of caffeine. Now, step number six is make sure you eat enough protein. Now, ideally, again, this is going to vary for each of us, but as a ballpark figure, aim for around 20 to 30 grams of protein with each meal. What that actually looks like in food is around about 100 to 150 grams of meat or fish. It might be a tin of tuna with a square of goat's cheese. It might be half a cup of beans with half a cup of quinoa. There's a lot of vegetarian alternatives as well. Um, that gives you a rough starting point to understand. Protein is important because it helps improve satiety. So it helps you feel fuller for longer. And it also allows for maintenance of, of any muscle mass whilst you're trying to lose fat mass. Because ultimately, if you don't have enough protein, any weight loss will be quite a good mix of fat and muscle and water, probably. So do bear that in mind. Make sure you, you know, you've got some, maybe it's yogurt and nuts and seeds in your brekkie um, or, you know, a good source with each of your main meals as well. Step number seven is don't skip the fats. Now, a lot of us are still a little bit cautious of incorporating fats in our diet, particularly if we're wanting to lose fat. But the reality is that they do help, uh, again, increase satiety. So they'll make you feel fuller for longer. But they'll also help with the absorption of certain nutrients. So things like vitamin D, which is essential for immune support, we need to be including fats for that to be absorbed efficiently. Um, it's also helpful for energy production, hormonal health, a number of functions in the body. So we do need some fats. Quality, though, is definitely key. So don't go out and load up on um, margarine and macas. <laughs> Opt for things like nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocado, and your oily fish. So salmon, trout, sardines, mackerel, that sort of stuff. They're all really healthy and should be in some form part of your daily diet. Step number eight is to load up on fibre. Now, this is a big one, which again, you're going to improve your satiety, so you're going to feel fuller for longer, but it also positively alters our microbiome, so the gut bacteria and bugs, ultimately. So it alters it in a way that allows for weight loss to occur much more easily. Now, when I talk about fibre, I don't mean metamucil. I mean all of your beautiful produce like fruit and veg, nuts and seeds, whole grains, that sort of stuff are all really high in fiber. So make sure that you've got some featuring at every single meal. Ideally snacks as well, things like um, veggie sticks with hummus, for example, make a great snack that'll load you up on fiber and numerous other health benefits too. Step number nine is, is to actually embrace hunger. 
I feel like in our society where we can now have access to food, particularly those of us in suburban Melbourne, I know when I was a kid, I lived on a farm and if you felt like a certain food uh, item that you didn't have in your house, it was a 20 minute drive into town. So who could be bothered, right? But now it's so much easier and Uber Eats as well. You don't even have to do anything to have food that's not perfect for you on your plate in crazy amounts of time. So if you feel hungry and it's, you know, half an hour to an hour before a meal, that's actually a really good thing. And our bodies are meant to give us those signals to help us seek out good food. But if it is longer than that, so if you're starting to get really hungry and ravenous two to three hours before your next meal, by all means, have a healthy snack to tie you over so that you're not just grabbing everything when it comes to that next meal. Um, but also recognize, check in your, with yourself each time you do go to reach for food. Am I actually hungry or am I getting food because this is a habitual time that I always eat or am I just bored? Because that's a big one too. And, and if it is one of those other things, if it's boredom, find something else to do, go for a walk or make yourself a herbal tea or something that's not going to derail your health goals, but um, at least gives you something to do. But certainly if it is true hunger, go with those suggestions I mentioned earlier. Step number 10 is keep your overnight fast to at least 12 hours. This one is really important from a research perspective to ensure that your body has time to rest and digest and actually allow your body to do what it needs to do and burn some of that fat that's already there. So if you eat dinner at 7 p.m., don't eat breakfast till after 7 a.m., as an example. Step number 11 is get individualised help. If you're in a rut, if you're unmotivated or something just doesn't feel right, um, maybe you've had recent blood tests that you're not happy with, go get specific guidance, it, whether it's me or another um, clinical nutritionist, it doesn't really matter, but do get help for making sure that you're able to reach your goals with ease. Step number 12, kind of along the lines of what I was getting with getting at with the caffeine, keep stress at a minimum. So when you're constantly in that state of fight or flight, it becomes really challenging for your body to lose weight because it wants to hold on to any extra fat in case you can't access any food for a while. Not that that's an issue these days, but once upon a time, our, our biology is created off that um, belief. So find something you enjoy, whether it is meditation or yoga, maybe it's playing an instrument or um, walking the dog, spending time in nature. It doesn't really matter. Find something that you enjoy that helps keep you calmer and less in that state of constant stress and do it every day. Hopefully that has helped with a few little tips, I will pass on to Lyndon. Thanks for that, Lisa. Guys, just a reminder, um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to use that chat box. We'll have a Q and A at the end and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions. And Lisa's got, um, if you see at the bottom right of her um, slides, she's got her details there if you ever just want to decide to have a look at her website or contact her. So I'm now going to be, sorry, it's not moving for some reason. There we go. Whoops. I'm going to be talking about um, load management for walkers. And I'll just say generally, this, this doesn't necessarily apply to just walkers. It's for anyone that's... Um, has any type of physical activity goals. The, the, the principles I'm gonna talk about today are very similar. So Lisa's mentioned um, the more energy intake aspect, the food aspect. The other part of, um, I guess, body composition is our exercise, how much energy we're, um, energy expenditure we have. And 
we're seeing some trends in the clinic. So spring's obviously just come and we've had a pretty brutal winter. You know, we've been locked down. Um, we've been limited to a five kilometer radius and now the sunshine has come out and we're getting more opportunities to be physically active. So what we're seeing um, in the clinic is we're, we're seeing people, they're just doing a little bit too much too quickly and they're getting injuries. So that's predominantly what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, as I mentioned at the start of this, these are some of our details for Melbourne Sports Physiotherapy. We've got three clinics at Essendon, North Melbourne and Blackburn. And I'll put our website there if you guys ever want to have a look at it. And we put up some blogs on different injuries. I think you can search it on the site. We, we put up some, um, some client information up there. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to give me an email, write that down and you can give me an email with any of your um, questions if you don't get a chance um, to put it in the chat box. And I just wanted to give another reminder, <laughs> keep using that chat box. We will do our best to answer the, um, all your questions. So like I mentioned, we're, we're seeing um, people having a spike in activity and people are becoming a bit more active now that spring has come out. And I've just listed some com common areas that can get injured, um, not just from walking, but an increase in physical activity. So we're seeing a lot of um, lower limb injuries because they're, they're, they're the, um, the muscles and the joints that are taking all the punishment when we're doing walking and running. So we're seeing a lot of calf tightness, Achilles, ankles, a lot of knee pain from runners. And what's a little bit more concerning is we're seeing some bone stress injuries. So we're seeing foot stress responses, foot stress fractures, and also a bit in the hip. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of plantar fascia pain, but I think when Ryan talks about his presentation, he'll probably be seeing a lot more of that than I do. And we're seeing some hip pain. And the last thing is a little bit less common. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily see a physio for this, but we're seeing a bit of blisters. People are getting new shoes. Um, they're not quite worn in, and then it's causing a lot of friction issues and they're getting blisters through there. So they're just some of the common injuries that we're seeing clinically, which has spiked in, I'd say the last, six weeks and these are the principles i guess for safe walking and safe exercise so it's it's all about balance and there's that balance between too little and too much and it's a bit of a goldie we call it the um uh, <laughs> the goldilocks sweet spot so if your exercise levels are too little you're deconditioning your walking and your exercise muscles so if you do something a bit more physically active, so let's say um, you catch up with a friend and you go for a bigger walk, that small increase, that might be cause an issue because you're not conditioned. Because if you're, if you're walking 5,000 steps a day and then your friend takes you on a walk and you walk 20,000 steps, your body's not used to it. And one of those injuries on my previous slide might be occurring. The other... Um, imbalance you can cause is if you're doing too much activity too soon. So this is, this is what we're seeing a little bit more of. Um, we're seeing a lot of people walking and running almost daily and they've, they've previously not been used to it. So they might be a footy player. They might be um, an office worker that enjoys going to the gym. They might be a swimmer and they've suddenly lost their ability to do their sport and physical activity. So they're taking up walking, or running and their body's not conditioned to it. So they're doing too much too soon. And we're seeing a lot of those overload injuries. And that big concern is when you get a bone um, stress response because management of that is a little bit specialized and you unfortunately do need to deload the joint if there is a bone injury in there. So that's what we're trying to avoid um, as physios. We're just trying to stop our patients getting any of those bone injuries. So we could, um, the main principle for safe walking, and it sounds like it's very common sense, is we've got this sweet spot. And that's the level that our body really likes. It's the bodies, it's the loads that we're doing without doing too much and too little. So that's the perfect load for maintenance or improvement. So this is a level where you're going to be feeling comfortable and conditioned for your walks. And this next point is absolutely vital. It's, a, it's all about consistency. Um, some of the people we see that 
a, a, a really, really conditioned. They might have five to 10 years of consistent physical activity. They're the ones whose bodies are in that sweet spot where they're just continuously loading it at that good level so that when they do a little bit less than normal, their body's still fine with it. And when they increase their activity, they've got that um, base, that base load through there. The biggest, um, I've written it in my next point, the biggest issue we're seeing is irregularity. So if you can see that example I've written, week one, let's say someone goes for two walks, week two, they go for six walks, week three, life gets busy, one walk, and then after that, they spike it again. And that inconsistency, your body absolutely hates that. You're better off just picking a consistent um, pattern and sticking to that and gradually loading that. So I've got, um, I've put two, examples and this is um this is super common so let's say you go on your holiday to europe and for us in melbourne it might be tasmania if we're lucky at the end of the year and let's say you've got a history of um say being an office worker so your job's not as physical as um say a tradie and for a lot of the office workers they've been working at home since march and we're losing a little bit of incidental exercise so if you take the train um, if you walk around the city, if you walk around the, the office, just talking to colleagues, having meetings, you've suddenly lost, you know, up to five to 6,000 steps a day. And if you're not, if you're not going outside for your walks, that's a really important um, amount of incidental load. So there's no gyms, there's no team sports. So that may have been halted. So let's say we, we get on our holiday to Europe or Tasmania and you start doing 15,000 to 20,000 steps per day. Within two weeks, in this example, person develops sore hips and ankle pain after, to, after that time. And the problem was their body wasn't conditioned for the holiday. So it sounds really counterintuitive um, to train for a holiday, especially if it's a bit more scenic in Europe, but you, you really do need to have a good base conditioning if you're not used to the punishment of walking 15 to 20,000 steps. On the other side, uh, example number two, let's say we go on a holiday to Fiji, so a bit, bit more beach and relaxing. And if we have a normally active person and they go for three weeks there and it's a very casual holiday and they come back to Melbourne and they um, recommence their normal physical activity and it might be walking or running and they go for five walks per week for one hour. What do we think is going to happen? So they've lost three weeks of their normal, their body's normal walking loads. And they've tried to go back to that too quickly. And they might, for example, develop Achilles pain. So their issue was they spiked their volume too quickly after a period of rest. So those two patterns, they're the things where we're most commonly seeing in clinic. And if anyone here has kids, <clears throat> um, just be really mindful that some of some of the um, the kids they haven't been running, doing sport, going to school, so they might be a bit deconditioned. And when community sport starts up, and you know if they're playing basketball six, eight, ten times a week, their body might be really susceptible to getting some of those patterns of injury. So we see our, we see trends as a as in physio, and after the Christmas holidays around mid-February, we see a lot of injuries because because kids aren't doing that much. They return back to school and their community sports and their bodies just break down. We also see a lot of injuries around October. And this is because it's the Melbourne Marathon and everyone starts training a bit more and then they get injured around there. And it's also because it's spring. So people come outside, they start doing more running and walking. So they're the two big um, seasonal trends we see as physios. I'd like to give you guys some tips on, on how to monitor walking loads. And when I see a lot of clients, they'll, they'll usually give me a time measure. Oh, okay. I'm walking, um, for 60 minutes. And we, we don't know what that means because if, if walking for 60 minutes is very different for everyone, you know, is it uphill? How intense is it? Are you with the partner? And it's usually a poor way to measure your walking loads. And the biggest reason is you get distracted. So you can talk, you can embrace nature, you can take breaks. You may be slowing down or speeding up if you've got a partner with you. So measuring how much you're walking through time or minutes alone, it's not the greatest measure. What, what, what we suggest 
is if you use an app or a pedometer or an exercise diary, they're the best things. Um, people that use Strava, RunKeep, or, or just use any app on their phone, that is so useful to go through their previous four, six, 12 weeks of um, data. And then we can actually see when they have a spike or what errors they made. And if you're not into that type of stuff, something as simple as a pedometer, it's really easy to monitor how much you're walking. It doesn't have to be super accurate, but if you've got a pedometer that's telling you, you know, one day your average is 8,000 steps and then you're walking 15,000 steps, that's almost double the volume. And that's just a recipe for the, for some of those injuries we mentioned before. The other thing um, to monitor is how you're feeling. So if you go for a big walk and you're feeling a bit sore, fatigued, heavy, there's some signs that your body may be overloaded. And this just doesn't apply to walking and physical activities. This might be something going on with your body as well. So Lisa didn't mention this, but we do see some people and they do feel fatigued, not just right. And then we have to look at their diet and bloods just to get the full picture. So if you've gone for, if you've increased your physical activities and you're um, walking a bit more and you're just not feeling right, it might be a sign that you're overtraining or you've just overloaded your muscles and body. And what you can just crudely do is when you go for a walk, give it a rating out of 10. You know, if it was hilly, if it was in the Dandenongs or Ferntree Gully and it was a big one and it was an eight out of 10 because there were some big steps there, some big hills, you know, for the next few days, if you're not used to it, you might just need to take it easy. I've written some tips um, to help us coming out of lockdown and recommencing um, physical activity and embracing the sunshine. If you're a beginner and you're looking to commence your exercise, you might start off by exercising every second day. So rather than going, trying to aim for every day, have a day off and your body will really appreciate that. Cause as I mentioned before, your body doesn't like aggressive changes in load. If you're, um, if you've got a history of injuries or if you're feeling not as fit, interval training is a really, really good method to commence a physical activity program. And it's, it might be something as simple as I'm going to walk for, um, you know, 1000 or 2000 steps. I'm going to have a rest for five minutes and then I'll go again. You might do it by time. So I might walk for 10 minutes, have a break, but interval training is really, really effective, especially for some of the runners out there. What we suggest to safely increase your walking volume is you change one variable every two to three weeks. And I've written in brackets, depending how you're going. And what I mean by variable is you change either duration, frequency, or intensity. You don't want to be messing around with all three at the same time. Duration, how long or far we're going. Frequency, how often? Am I doing it three times a week, four times a week, five times a week? Intensity, how hard are we pushing? Am I going for walks that were previously a six out of 10? And now I'm going for these big ones that are nine out of 10. We clinically see a lot of people increase all three within six weeks and then their bodies break down. So if you want to have a really safe um, method of progression, just look to change one of those every two to three weeks. And it's, and it's really tempting at the start when you're feeling great. And if you've had a history of um, a sport to jump back into it, but if you keep changing those variables too quickly, unfortunately the body will break down. Lisa mentioned a bit about having your why and goal setting Think about what your ideal goal is and look at, um, look at how long it's going to take to get there. So I remember I saw a runner and they wanted to run a marathon, the Melbourne marathon, and he wanted to do it within three months. And I was, I just looked at him and I said, I don't think that's achievable because your goal is too big and we can't um, consistently load you to get that result. And after that, we, we set a new goal going for the half marathon and that was um, a really big thing. So if you, if you know what you want to achieve, if you've got a holiday coming up or you're looking to get back to sport, think about your goal and think about the timeframes and you've just got to be keeping those steady 
slow builds to get up there. Next point, very similar, consistency is key. That's absolutely vital. Even in periods where you're getting hammered at work, the kids are giving you a hard time, work's a bit stressful. If you can just maintain a little bit of physical activity, your body will really appreciate that and it'll stop it deconditioning too much. Too. So when you are having a bit more free time, it'll be ready to rock and roll. The last point um, is really, really important. Strength work. It's absolutely vital for helping fatigue and cramping. So the stronger your body is, the more punishment it can take pretty much. So what I've also put in here is it's really simple exercise. Um, calf raise, you're going, holding onto a wall, going up on your toes. On the right, you can see the person's doing it off a step so that their ankle can go through full range and holding onto weight. Um, this exercise is really, really helpful for anyone with foot, ankle, Achilles injuries because that chain is so interconnected and it's really simple exercise like that. It has an amazing preventative property. So if you're looking to recommence exercise or build up your volume, something as simple as a calf raise, doing that three times a week, as many reps as you can, that will really help your body. So that's my presentation. The key messages are progressive overload. So slow and steady. Avoid massive spikes in your training volume. Remember that consistency is key. We want to be changing one variable every two to three weeks. If you're looking to monitor yourself, an app, a pedometer or exercise diary is really, really beneficial. If you go on break or on a holiday, remember when you come back to town and you get back into your physical activity, you've got to slowly build it back up. And the last thing, um, Ryan will jump and um, talk about this a bit more, is equipment is really important as well. Make sure you have some comfortable shoes. So if you guys have any questions about that, use the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them at the Q&A at the end. So I'll pass you guys on to Ryan now. Thanks, Lyndon. Hi, my name's Ryan. I'm a patient at Melbourne Podiatry Clinic. Uh, we're a team of five podiatrists um, working across two locations, so a clinic in Essendon um, and a clinic in Blackburn as well. So I'm stationed at Blackburn myself. And um, Lyndon, I'll get you to jump across just to the next, uh, next slide for me. So tonight I'll be talking about uh, footwear and some of the things that you can do. They just, just one back there, sorry, Lyndon. Um, yeah, some of the things that you can do um, where to reduce load, so some of what Lyndon was speaking about, and some of the things that you can consider when buying shoes to help reduce the risk of injury as well. So um, again, as Lyndon mentioned, we're also seeing quite a big uptick in uh, rates of injury, so things like plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendinopathy, um, stress fractures, um, ankle injuries, shin splints and the like. I mean, that's also likely just due to the, um, you know, sporting uh, grounds closed um, and sporting options limited. So people are you know, walking more and running more as well. Um, so, yeah, I'll get you to flip to the next one there for me, Lyndon. So some of the things, um, again, that I'll be going through is what to look for in a shoe. How do we know what the best shoe is specifically for walking um, or any other activity as well? So, um when should I replace my shoes? How do I know at what point? Um, and some of the things to look for as well, and also um, where to go, um, some, a place that has some great options and some variability as well uh, with different shoes. So if we think about um, walking and movement in general, our feet are um, what contacts the ground first. So it is really important to make sure we account for um, our movement deficit so the way we move is really really important to so some of the strength flexibility and that ties into shoes as well so that can play a role in how we move okay and then i'll get you to jump across to the next one for me so just a side note as well so all participants tonight um, for the webinar we do have uh, an exclusive offer it's a new patient offer it's basically a gap free consult um, for all people with private health insurance or a $59 fee um, if you don't have private health insurance. Um, basically what we do as part of the new patient offer is we go through um, what your injury is, 
why is it occurring, some of the steps on how to fix it and also prevent it from coming back. So that's where we'd look at your footwear and also um, some of the uh, features of the footwear and if it is suitable uh, for your movement patterns and some of your goals as well. And I'll get you to jump to the next one there for me, Lyndon. Yeah, so just a quick question um, that I would like to ask everyone. So if you have any injury concerns, pop it in the little chat box um, and some of your walking goals as well. And any shoes that you're currently um, wearing as well. I'm interested to see uh, the sort of range and styles and that sort of thing. I know um, there's a few popular brands um, like the Asics and Mizuno and that type of thing, which I'll go through. Um, so yeah, leave a, a comment below and um, I'd love to see what everyone's wearing. All right, so, sorry, just having some tech troubles there. All right, so in terms of shoe fits as well, so an interesting study came out um, in 2018 and researchers, um, I think so, Leah, so you're wearing ASICs, they're certainly a, a great brand as well. ASICs sketches, great. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. That's awesome. So Lisa's uh, ASICs and New Balance for street shoes as well. So a bit of a mix. Definitely important to have um, a rotation of shoes as well. Um, and yeah, then that's great. Brooks also really, really uh, strong brand as well. So in terms of um, the study that I was talking about, so back in 2018, they looked at um, how well uh, people really understand um, what sort of shoes they should be wearing. And they found an interesting thing that approximately 75% of people are purchasing shoes that don't accommodate the feet in length or width. And, and we kind of wonder, how is that possible? And there are some key things to understanding um, fitting as well. So um, one of the big ones is width as well. So width is something that's um, really, really important and something not necessarily taken into account uh, at first. But I suppose like, the big one that people don't necessarily um, consider width. Um, and so one of the, the key things for that as well is width allows the, the foot to spread out in a more natural and functional position. So really important um, uh, consideration as well. And then I'll get you to jump to the next one for me. So that's also where um, a walking gait assessment comes into um, account. So that's something that we do as part of our um, uh, consults. So that's where you look um, at things, if we can, oh, Viva Barefoot, Julia, that, that's awesome. Uh, so we've got a barefooter there, which is great. Um, and so some of the things that we do with, um, with a walking gait assessment is we look at um, what's bringing on the symptoms. So we might try and attempt to reproduce the symptoms um, in a really real way so we can see what's happening and, and where that flare up is happening and be as specific as possible with, with understanding it. Also gives us a, an indication as to what to, um, what to hone in on, look at some of your strength, flexibility, asymmetry as well. Um, and of course, your footwear. One sec. Okay, so some key considerations when buying footwear. So footwear, or rather our feet tend to swell towards the end of the day. So um, a good time to buy would be towards the end of the day. Um, and that can vary from, you know, upwards of a size even. So you might think you're an eight, try at the end of the day, hot summer's day, you're actually a nine. So really, really key important thing to, to consider as well. So um, of course, the um, when trying on the shoes as well, make sure to stand up when you're measuring, not sitting down. The reason is, again, that the feet spread out when we stand and um, it, it gives you a more accurate um, account of, um, of your true sizing as well. So with the width, so most people might not be used to having a wide fitting shoe, um, but I generally tell my patients that, um, you know, if there's the option um, of going for a wide, 
um, is definitely worth it. Um, again, just due to that ability for the toe to spread out and in, in a more functional position. So definitely give that a try. Um, and what happens if I have orthotics? So um, if you do have orthotics, you want to go for a, a shoe that's quite neutral uh, or, or rather is neutral, meaning it doesn't have any support. Um, and that allows uh, the orthotic to, to do its job to accommodate the orthotic. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing with what um, what shoe is um, you know doing doing what is, is this a support shoe is it a neutral shoe um, you know is it a barefoot shoe whatever it is and and that's where it is certainly worth getting professionally fitted and that can be at places like um, the running company um, or places like athletes foot as well they're really well trained in their ability to assess um, and also just a, a fit as well so yeah and in terms of um walking and running as well yeah just the next one definitely really good um so, so suitable shoes um you know worth having is something specific for that activity so it has to be a specific walking or running shoe it, it is the best uh, thing for, for walking or running so we don't want something like a, a gym shoe where it's quite flat um as well so we want something that's that really has uh, the necessary tread and stability as well in, in the shoe. Um, some of the things to look for in um, in shoes. Um, so we see at the back there where it says a heel counter. So we want a firm heel counter. We don't want somewhere or a shoe that the back can just fold in or it can just collapse in. Um, and that, that's really, really important. You find um, a really firm heel counter with some of the higher end shoes um, as well. So um, in terms of brands, um, so Asics and Brooks are probably among the best new balances in there as well. And for any barefoot people as well, Vivo Barefoot's pretty good as well, but you certainly have to be conditioned um, for that. So, so I would stick with the Asics and Brooks um, and the New Balance there. They're my go-to, absolutely. All right. And um, in terms of how do you know when, when your shoes need to be replaced as well? So have a look at the outsole wear pattern. So if you have a look at picture number one, you can see on the left, the outsole is quite worn. Um, so if it gets to that point, um, it's not doing its job sufficiently. So um, you certainly uh, replace it earlier than, than, than that point as well. Um, also, if we see in picture two, so the midsole, so um, just where the, little, the letter B is, so if that, is not um, able to, uh, if you're able to compress it and push down on it and it kind of stays down and it's not, um, you know, coming up or, or returning back to its normal um, shape, I suppose, then the ability for that shoe to provide support and rebound is, 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 is gone. So that's when you'd want to look at um, changing shoes as well. So another key giveaway is, is it'll be quite a permanent crease in that area as well. So um, that's certainly a, a, another um, thing to keep in mind or, or to look for um, when you do unrest my shoe as well. So also other things that can um, be a bit of a giveaway is if you're starting to get niggles, um, maybe it's a first time niggle in, in a certain area, um, just have a look at your shoe and see if it's doing um, the job that it should be doing. Um, and importantly, um, check your strength and movement um, as well. So um, as Lyndon and, and I discussed, so uh, really important as part of a, I suppose, a holistic um, picture of um, footwear and, and movement and recovery. Um, as well. So um, I hope that was uh, helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I guess I'll put it out to, to everyone. If you have any questions for myself, Lisa, um, or Lyndon, um, please fire away. Thanks for that, Ryan. I might um, just get us back to our home screen so we can um, see everyone's faces. There we go. So um, we might go to the top and we'll have a look at some of the questions and see who they're aimed for. Um, so our first question was from Mark Roberts. Any preventative exercises for adductor problems? Bit worried when we get back to tennis. Um, 
yeah, so I, I think that one's a bit more, a bit more at um, physio. So if you've got a past history of adductor issues and you've seen someone for them, some of those exercises that your clinician gave you, if you just do those twice a week or so, that will help um, strengthen up those muscles. And it's all about loading consistency. So if you can try go for a jog or do a bit of change of direction, agility, running, that will just mean when you return to tennis, you're not going to be um, shocking your body with a new load. So thanks for that question, Mark. Um, let's keep going down. Leah, I found the idea of 12 hours of not eating very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely appreciate that one. Um, probably my best tips, obviously make the 12 hours when you, there's a good chunk that you're asleep. Don't try and fast during the day. Um, and, you know, make it a consistent time that's going to work for you. So if you have dinner at a set time, if you're craving stuff up, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's the odd night where you have a dessert, but on other days, you know, have a herbal tea or something like that that's not going to add extra, uh, I guess, calories to your day, but, you know, you're still kind of giving yourself something <laughs> um, and, you know, opt for one that helps with sleep even if you want. Um, and then a lot of people find, um, obviously, depending on your work uh, situation, this is not going to be helpful for the boys, but uh, oftentimes just to have your breakfast a bit later. Um, you know, traditionally speaking, COVID aside, uh, some of my clients find it easier to just actually take their breakfast to work and have it um, just before they start the day or something like that, as opposed to, you know, some people are getting up and have long commutes. So to have breakfast at 5 or 6 a.m. isn't particularly helpful, but obviously it depends on your unique situation and and whatnot, but it's, it's more about what you do most days as opposed to every day. Beautiful. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've got a question from Naval. Hi, Lyndon. I've been suffering from my right um, feet pain, specifically in my arch. So when I start running, I get shin pain. Okay. Um, that is a question that's a little bit complicated to answer on the internet, just because um, a lot of things could be causing that pain and we'd need to look at those, um, the foot and running style and all the muscle strength, etc. cetera. Um, that's, that's probably a question that um, crosses over to Ryan's area as well. Um, I'm not going to answer that one now, but if you want, feel free to throw me an email and I'm happy to give more details or give you a buzz about that one. Um, we've got a question from Leah. Should 10,000 steps be a daily goal? Okay, great question. The answer is it depends. So it depends what your goals are. So if, if, if you're looking to, um, if you're looking, for example, to, to lose weight, that could be a very achievable um, goal to help burn some energy. If your background is gym or cycling, then 10,000 steps, it's, it's not a goal that you need to hit. So it, it all depends on on um, what your physical activity goals are. I know that's a bit of a, a around the circle answer, but so pretty much so long as you're getting some sort of physical activity, whether it's um, swimming, resistance training, walking, that ten thousand steps it doesn't necessarily need to happen if you're doing something physical. So it's it's that physical um, exercise that's more important. Yeah, that's a good answer. Okay, we got one from um, Michelle. I have found since working online at home, sitting for eight hours a day, my sciatica is very bad. I do walk my dogs for 30 to 45 minutes a day and do my set exercise. What else could I do as I can't access a gym at the moment or a personal trainer? Okay, that's um, we're we're seeing. I'm I'm predominantly seeing three main injuries. I'm seeing lower back, I'm seeing neck, and I'm seeing knee pain. The lower back and the neck pain. It's due to a lot of office workers. They they're working from home and they're in front of the computer all day. And I'm seeing yeah, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa. Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of knee because there's no sport to do. So everyone's taking up running. So everyone's getting runners knee pain. 
the, the advice I give for people that are getting lower back issues is do your best to break up your day. So if, you, if, you, if you've got to sit in front of your computer for eight hours, every half an hour or every 45 minutes, literally just stand up, march on the spot, go for a walk and break up that day. There's no such thing as perfect posture, but your body likes movement. So if you sit in front of the computer upright, or if you sit hunched, if you hold that for 30 to 45 minutes, you're going to get sore somewhere. And if you're having sciatica, it's, it's likely there's a bit of a capacity issue. So you just got to get moving, do your best. Um, you know, the gyms are closed. PTs aren't available at the moment, but you're just doing your best. So if you normally do squats, you might just be doing that with no weight to stay active. Thanks for that question, Michelle. And, um, yeah, there's a question from Leah. So she asks, does the $59 fee apply if you've been to the clinic for physio um, and should like to make a podiatry appointment? Yep, that's fine, Leah. Um, yeah, it doesn't apply, so that's okay. Um, I'm happy to help you. So just um, feel free to call the clinic or, or book in online um, as well. Meredith, um, when should you see a physio and when should you see a podiatrist? <laughs> there's a lot of crossover in our professions, um, I guess um, if you've got if you if you've got foot pain, I think it's better off seeing a podiatrist because the foot is a really specialised area. There's so many muscles and joints in there that, that podiatry is a it's a profession that is specifically revolved around looking at the foot and higher up the chain. Um, as a physio, there are specialist um, foot, uh, foot physios out there but I think you'd be better off seeing a podiatrist if it's a foot injury. If it's an ankle or above, then we're both happy to see it. And what Ryan and I, cause we work um, um, very, very close to each other. We often see patients that are a little bit out of our scope. And if I see someone um, that's got heel pain and I just don't feel comfortable, I send them straight to Ryan and Ryan does the same thing. If he's gets someone coming in with foot pain and they've got heel pain, sorry, um, hip pain, he'll get that, um, that second opinion through there. So it really depends on the injury. If it's foot, I gen general rule of uh, thumb, if it's foot, footwear, anything to do in that region, probably better off seeing a podiatrist. Uh, next question is from Lauren, and this one's for Lisa. Can you see that one, Lisa? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so um, any tips for those who love baking? <laughs> so, um, it is definitely possible to still continue baking whilst on a weight loss journey. Um, obviously, if you're not in a weight loss phase, baking is probably not so much of an issue, but if you are trying to lose weight, you do obviously need to be careful of how often you're consuming it. So whilst it's a little bit more challenging at the moment, my normal recommendation would be do it once a week tops and make it on a day that you can either take it to work <laughs> or take it to a event with friends um, a barbecue or we can do uh you know an outside gathering with five people now so um take it to a little picnic with some mates and offload some of it so that you're not trying to eat a whole cake by yourself because that's when you can have issues or make things like muffins or something that freeze really well so that way you can enjoy one and then chuck the others away in the freezer for a later time. Hopefully that helps. Um, Leah has also mentioned that <laughs> even so, with the tips I've already suggested, finishing eating by 8 p.m. can be hard. With that, just make sure you're eating enough during the day too. Um, sometimes when people try and lose weight, they really restrict heavily uh, too much. And then you're just going to be ravenous by the end of the day. So make sure you do actually eat enough for the other meals throughout the day. And then hopefully by the evening, you're not quite so ravenous. From Dylan, I have very poor flexibility and have pain while walking, running through the sole of my foot, especially while on an incline. Could flexibility be the cause of pain here? Um, Ryan, do you want to have a go at that one? Sure, sure, sure. So um, flexibility certainly could be um, something that's contributing. Um, also, lack of foot strength and ankle strength. So there's a few things to, to consider. I mean, a good starting point is to grab a massage ball or, or a lacrosse ball 
and you want to do a foot release. So you can always jump on Google or rather YouTube and just type in foot release massage ball. And you want to work your foot um, on top of the ball and just release a lot of the muscles underneath there. Um, give that a go. You want to do that for about five or 10 minutes um, at a time, um, especially, um, you know, pre-run and that type of thing as well. But um, more important than, than uh, flexibility is strength. So that ties into load and, and how much we can tolerate. So, um, I mean, I often find that, you know, a lot of my uh, patients who come in, um, I'll check their foot strength and their, their calf strength, and it's, it seems to be lacking uh, quite considerably. I suppose it's a funny concept, like, you know, people go into the gym and they sort of, you know, train the leg or tra train the chest shoulders, but who kind of trains the feet um, um, looks like we might be having a little yeah, bit I think we've uh, lost the right a bit oh, oh, um, do you yeah, want to maybe lost him to finish off that question Dylan um, flexibility it, Is that... it, 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 um, it could be it could be a part of the clinical problem. Flexibility, um, one way, a good way to measure it is look at a left versus right comparison in a, in a stretch, um, an ankle stretch or a, um, like a hamstring stretch. If you feel tighter or there's a restriction in there, it's likely flexibility. If you don't have a, if your left versus right is similar, it's gonna be something else. It'll be strength loading footwear. Yep. Okay. Um, got another question from Rachel for you, Lisa. Okay. Uh, so 12 year old daughter refusing to eat brekkie saying that she's not hungry. Is there a point in forcing her? That's a tough one depending, I would say, um, in a big part on her weight as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of, um, I guess, particularly from the region I'm in, we have quite a health conscious society and more of the problem is often around under eating. And so in that scenario, I would definitely be encouraging them to be eating a breakfast. It doesn't have to be a massive meal, but research does show that health outcomes are better if breakfast is consumed over a long period of time. A huge study was done recently on this. So it could be a smoothie or something little, um, a tub of yogurt and a banana or some, you know, something small that just gives her you know, some energy for school and um, one of her other activities she's during, doing during the day, I think it is important that she has something. Even if it's from a weight loss perspective, again, health outcomes are better with brekkie. And oftentimes if she's not eating, if it is a hunger aspect, it could be to do with um, not having enough um, of gastric acid being secreted by her gut. And there's quite a few things why she might not be hungry. And I would suggest perhaps touching base with a health professional regarding that. Um, and just making sure that there's um, no disordered eating patterns going on there because they are incredibly common in that age bracket. So just be mindful of that too. And, and it, you know, we're not all designed to eat the same amounts of foods at each meal. So try and just encourage her to have something um, minimal to start off with and see how she goes. Got Ryan back on board too. Yeah. <laughs> um, next question we have is from Rhonda. So Rhonda um, got a history as a squash player and obviously squash has stopped. Started a new job walking 18 to 20 kilometers each day. Well, that's huge. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Contract has wound up and now looking for suggested routines to restart. Have done 50 minute runs twice a week and some five kilometer walks of late, but now enduring leg cramps, particularly in the thigh at night. Um, so my question to you, Rhonda, is did you gradually build up those 50 minute runs or were they just done very recently? If, if, if you don't have much of a running history and you're jumping back into that type of volume, that, that's a big run, a 50 minute run. Um, that's looking upwards of 10 to, 10 to 12 kilometers um, at pace. The big key with that is, as I mentioned in my slides, it's progressive loading. 
if you're struggling at that level, feel um, try going every second day, try doing some interval training. And the big one for the leg cramps and at night, if it's in your calves, you've got to get your calf raised strength and endurance up. So if you're a runner doing that type of volume, we'd recommend you getting pretty close to 30 calf raises. So you can just go on the wall, go up and down on your toes, see how many you can get. If you're getting a difference between left and right, or if you're not getting close to 30 for that level of activity, you might need a bit of strength work to do. Because when we're lacking that strength and capacity, our body will cramp or get the tightness sensation. Um, next question. Can I also quickly add to cramping can be a nutritional imbalance as well. So if your load hasn't dramatically changed, I think um, she's mentioned that she's always done runs, but um, yeah, if, if that's the case, consider perhaps electrolyte imbalances. Um, Magnesium is a big one that a lot of people aren't getting enough of, or it could be your sodium potassium balance isn't quite right. Go and see someone about that just to double check if you're in doubt. And we just have some follow on. Um, it's in the thighs um, and taking magnesium. Yep. Uh, so, it, yeah. 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 Make sure it's the right one for you too and that it's doing the job. Um, if it's, if the cramps are in your thighs, then you, might be needing to do um, exercises targeted to that. So if it's at the um, back of the thigh and it's more the hamstring, you've got to do some hamstring strength exercises. And if it's more at the front, the quads, you might need to be doing some more quad dominant exercises. So something like a squat or some single leg step ups, they'll really build some strength and capacity in the legs. Um, we'll move on to our next question. This is from Alicia. How's it going, Alicia? For walking, are we better on focusing on stride length or stride frequency, or should we keep our stride as natural as possible? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll give my interpretation of this, and Ryan and Lisa, if you guys want to give yours, please feel free to. So, and just to give you guys a background, Lisa used to be a very, very elite runner. So if you guys have any questions on running, or stuff like that, she can answer them easily. Lyndon so, was a training partner though too. <laughs> we, yeah, we actually used to He's underselling that. himself there too. So in terms of walking, the, the advice I'd give is keep it as natural as possible. When you're, if you're artificially trying to change your stride length or your stride frequency, your body's not used to it. And you, you're, you're really pushing something that isn't meant to be pushed. We give that advice to our runners as well. Lisa and I have both seen some pretty average runners and they, they don't look very good, but for them, their running style gets them a national title or an Olympic title. And you've got to respect that. So if your norm is to, um, so I'll go on. I'd keep it as natural as possible because you just don't want to be artificially trying to change something if it isn't needed. What are your thoughts on that, Lisa? Yeah, I agree. It's, I think sometimes, um, you know, we build up those compensations to, to um, run a certain way because our bodies are designed, you know, it might be that one leg is slightly longer than the other or something and that has made that a certain style is easier for that person and trying to change it can sometimes um, make them focus too much just on technique and not, necessarily on just running and yeah I think we can tend to focus too much on technique sometimes absolutely yeah um last thing oh that was just for a comment hmm. I think that's um all the questions and we might wrap it up because it's getting a bit late and everyone's up we, we, we all go to <laughs> Oh, there's no, there's no curfew, so we can oh, yeah. <laughs> do any time pressure. But we just want to say um, a massive thank you to everyone who signed in tonight. We really appreciate you guys jumping on and giving us all your questions. And if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to contact us. Our emails, um, websites, numbers are all there, and we're always happy to have a talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys.